Oh, sì. Hello everybody, I guess it's time to go, so let's go. Uh, I'm Alex Glow, thank you for coming. I work at Hexter, which is a community for hardware makers to teach and learn and share stuff together uh, with, with their own projects. Um, awesome to be here, thank you Alejandro for inviting me. Yee! Shout, out, shout out to uh, you know, all the maker spaces around here, fantastic. Okay, so we're gonna talk about hardware startups and sharing, so if you're a maker, you'll learn how to like what resources may be available to you from hardware companies that you want to work with. And if you are part of a hardware startup or considering doing crowdfunding or starting a company, uh, hopefully you'll learn something that will help you do it in a clever way. So we did an interview with Limor Fried recently of Adafruit. And basically, you know, we asked her why, why are open source uh, startups profitable? This is a question that you often get from people who are used to working in enterprise. They're like, if you just give your stuff away, then how do you make money? We don't understand. And her answer is basically, it, it turns you into a good guy. It grows your user base beyond anything that you might otherwise do. Uh, and you can definitely be an open source startup and be successful, just like you can be an asshole and be successful. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily affect how profitable you are, but it definitely affects how, uh, how cool you are. <laughs> Woo. Nice. So yeah, um, first off, when you're starting out, you're probably going to be thinking about crowdfunding. And there's a couple of ways to do this. So Particle, which is a, uh, an Arduino-enabled um, board that is basically, it connects to Wi-Fi, and it's very small, so they're trying to get you to embed it in things. Uh, they were open source from the start, and in large part they attributed this to the fact that they wanted to get developers' attention. If you want to do crowdfunding and you're a hardware company, it's very useful to be open source. Just from a pragmatic point of view, people are more excited to share your stuff. They see you as someone who gives, so when you're asking for something, you're going to be more successful. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you have everything in, uh, set up in advance. If you don't have all your ducks in a row ahead of time, then you're going to end up with delays beyond the usual delays, which is normal with crowdfunding and people expect. If you end up vastly uh, underestimating what you need or the time that you need to deliver what you're uh, advertising, then you're going to end up being a bad guy. Don't be a bad guy. And uh, let's see. So the other thing with uh, getting money is 
your um, investors may not want you to be open source. But the reason that many actual enterprise companies do this is so that people become aware of your product through being a maker. For example, with Particle, lots of people learn to work with the Photon in order to build home automation systems. And some of those people, maybe a small percentage, but some of those people are going to work for hardware companies that are trying to build products using Wi-Fi connectivity. And when the time comes for them to design their products, people who are used to working with the particle devices are going to be more likely to advocate for that within their own companies. Come on. Hardware. It's going to go three in a row now. OK, so you don't have to be totally open source, though, because like Raspberry Pi is fairly open source, but not everything they do is open source. For example, some parts of uh, the OS are proprietary, so that they can uh, you know, keep doing their thing. Uh, and it also keeps your investors happy. Sometimes you simply can't do open source, because in order to raise money, investors want to see that you have a way of protecting what you're creating, at least until you're a very stable company. So here's a few things that you can do, even if you aren't open source. It's in the hardware design. So if you build something that's easy to open and reassemble, even if the design isn't open source, people will be able to figure that out. The hardware community is smart. Uh, so this is the NeuroSky, which is a brainwave reading EEG headset. And it's very popular among makers, because unlike some more powerful headsets, which may even have APIs and maybe charge you for use of that, uh, it's very easy to snap open. Uh, the screws are easily visible and accessible. They're hidden under stickers, but you can find them. And they use Phillips heads, which are very common. Or if you use Torx heads, that's also going to be pretty easy for a standard maker to be able to disassemble with things that are available in their maker space. And once you've disassembled it and put your stuff in there, uh, you can either create your own enclosure for it, or you can put it back together without it looking like a huge mess. It's easy to understand. So this is a hex bug, a little spider bot with six legs. And its design is extremely elegant. So when you open it up, you can see the two little DC motors that drive the legs. There's one that drives the legs forwards and backwards when it walks. And there's one that rotates the turret to change which way it's facing, which is basically your steering. Um, and they made that very clear by not obscuring everything. And even the case is translucent, so you can see through it without even opening it up and see that, oh, these screws are going to be easy to take apart. It snaps apart. And like you can see the inner workings of it. At the same time, they, uh, this thing works on an infrared signal with a remote. And they've made it very easy for you to, uh, they've labeled the PCB and shown you exactly what each thing is. So it's understandable. And here's the NeuroSky again. It's easy to adapt because they, um, they don't squash people who put tutorials online. They actually share them on their official website. They're like, if you want to hook it up to an Arduino, here's how to do it. And that's actually, it's useful to you as a company because people are going to do it anyway. So you might as well tell them how to do it without uh, killing their warranty. And if you do that, as in the case of these things, actually the price for used ones has gone way up. And presumably so has the demand for new ones. Because the more people see that they're able to use it as a tool to develop their own pieces of art and product, uh, the more excited they're going to be to use your product over someone else's. These are, in fact, a couple of pieces I made for a fashion show where uh, I adapted the brainwave cat ears into like these horns and wings and stuff. So uh, what can makers do with this type of technology? You can replace modular parts. If you make it modular, uh, then it's uh, much easier to work with. Uh, you can harness the signal. So on the NeuroSky, the cables are very accessible. And the solder points are also easy to solder to. They're not super hidden away. Oh, yeah, And uh, they share their tutorials. Plus, you can tap into the hardware very easily. You can swap out the existing brains or put in your own on this spider bot uh, to be able to control it however you like. You can hack it at the remote level with the infrared beam, or you can take out the remote controller entirely and drive the motors directly with whatever you can fit in the enclosure. Then, of course, there's the software level. And even if you can't go totally open source, you can publish an API, which means that developers who have worked with any number of different programming languages, like Python, Ruby, and JavaScript, are very popular. 
uh, they'll be able to hook up into your hardware, and you can control exactly how much interface they have with your hardware um, and the firmware inside. Uh, so people can write controls for the device. Uh, they can hook into, uh, for example, Weather Underground allows you to make mother-controlled robots because they have an API. You can even charge for it if you like, but that's kind of a lamer move, I think. Uh, you can connect it logically to other robots and other pieces of software that you're making. Uh, and you can harness the onboard sensors. For example, the Sphero, uh, you might have seen this robotic BB-8 ball that's based on the new Star Wars movie. And it's adorable, for one thing. But also, it is, uh, it's open-ish. So they publish an API where, for their regular Sphero balls, um, you can change the color, you can read the accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. So you could turn it into an instrument or like a feedback device or any kind of other like life monitoring thing. Uh, they've even created, just recently, a version of the Sphero ball that's clear so that students can see what's inside of it. Uh, and they've started really pushing their community. So even for established companies, they're interested in making it more open source because it's already working for them. And then, of course, uh, there's a multitude of boards and projects that are compatible with Arduino these days, because this is one of the first standards that lots of makers learn. And once you learn that, you're able to work with the particle photon, you're able to work with the teensy, you're able to work with the light blue beam, and yet, like, the, I, I couldn't even tell you how many boards there are that work with this, because there's new ones every day, and they have things like, I'm tailored for Bluetooth, or tailored for wearables, or tailored for just having Wi-Fi and a low price point or whatever. And then there's software tools like If This Then That, OctoBlue, and Cylon.js, where they're managed by a single company, but uh, they accept and they work with other companies, so they have tailored hook-ins. So for example, OctoBlue is a visual programming language in the browser, and it enables you to have nodes for things like the Sphero or the NeuroSky headset or other things like that and connect them without ever writing a line of code. And that makes it a lot more likely for people to use your stuff, too. So, so sort of review. Um, you might be awesome if you have hardware that is open or open-ish. Make it easy for people to disassemble, reassemble, change the controls, things like that. Uh, if it's programmable, uh, whether directly via an API, or by modifying the firmware itself, or with something like if this, then that. If it's embeddable, so like the Photon is basically a, a cheap dev board that they use to popularize their Wi-Fi chip. Same with the Light Blue Bean, which is the same thing but for Bluetooth. Um, you make a maker version, and then you make the chip that's embeddable so that people can use it in products. Giving developers early access is always a plus, like Oculus did. As you can see, they grew massively in popularity. And you don't have to have a completely finished project yet. You can share it as a beta. Having an acceptable price point is, of course, important. Uh, after a while, it'll probably go on the Amazon market, eBay. But to start off with, yeah. And then strong community support. So again, when you're crowdfunding, a huge point that Zach Zupala of Particle made is that when they were running their Kickstarter, when people ask them questions about the upcoming product, they would direct people to their forums off-site or to their project page so that when the Kickstarter was over, that knowledge wouldn't be lost. And neither would the people who had supported them. Because you can keep sending people emails for years after the fact. But eventually, that's going to expire in its novelty. And so if you build your forums and build your project site, get people used to going there for information, uh, either posting questions or looking for answers, then those people are going to stay with you because they'll see more exciting stuff. So it's tempting to see open source as completely free, like there's no investment on your part. But that's not the case, obviously. Not only because you might lose funding from uh, important people, but also because if you want to do it right, if you want to do open source, you should do it right because if you release something that's really difficult to work with, then you're going to get a bad rap. If you release something that, from the start, has support, has a logical organization, and um, a flow for how people can submit, for example, feature requests or pull requests, 
uh, then that's going to make it a lot more popular for people to work with. Um, you, this takes dev time. This takes developer time on the part of your team. Uh, it takes supporting the community. You can't just put it out there and then vanish. I mean, you can, but it'll probably suck. Uh, and then it takes uh, organizing the data that people can get out of it and formatting that in a legible sort of way. So for example, the Misfit, which is an activity tracker, that company thought about open sourcing their data so that you could read the data packets coming from your activity tracker. But they found that that was not going to work because they didn't have the, invest or the developer time to invest in developing something that matched the beautiful quality of the product. And so if you can't make it up to the standards of quality that your product demands, then it may not be the best choice for you. But at the same time, you get free uh, troubleshooting. You get feedback from your community. So instead of going out and doing surveys, you can still do that, but you get basically instant feedback from new users. And also you get feedback on security, which is usually important as we approach a world of connected devices. Um, you want to make sure that people discover the vulnerabilities in your product while there's only like a few hundred people using it, instead of a few million people with smart cars that can be hacked with an ID that's printed on the outside of the car, which actually happened. So. Try and get it out there before it's too late. I've noticed that some of the companies that are most successful with makers come from makers themselves. So there's some big companies that are pushing maker boards. And despite the fact that they're giving them out like candy, they're having a lot of trouble getting a stable user base and excited user base developed. And I believe this is partly because they're used to de designing for developers. These companies, Particle, Pinocchio, and Hologram, are three hardware or hardware interface companies that all were founded by makers because they were frustrated with the options that were already available. And they felt like they couldn't work with them because they weren't user friendly at all. And back in the day, that was fine. Like, no one, there wasn't really this huge maker movement that people were trying to hook into. But at this point, the maker movement is a few years old at least. And it's growing, and there's no excuse anymore to have a shitty UI. Because people are expecting, they have these options. They see things like the particle, and they're like, why would I use your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth thing if I have to you know, install a custom IDE for it, if I have to learn a new programming language for it, if I have to do, jump through all these ho hoops to use your project? You should be making it easy for people to use your product and giving them tools that make it fun. So if you want your product to get um, widespread adoption among the maker community, the first thing that people are going to ask is, what do I do with it? And you have to be able to answer that question. And you can do anything is not an answer. That's worse than no answer, because that means that people will get paralyzed. They'll be like, oh. Well, I have some projects, but I don't know if this is like the best use for it. So decide what you're aiming for and publicize that. And the best way to do that is to publish projects and tell people how to use it. So this is the sort of, um, this is the interface that we have on Hackster for sharing projects. And you see this is for Particle. Uh, and basically, if you go and look for a particular type of project or a platform, you can instantly come up with different types of projects going from like home automation to robotics to wearable tech to drones to pet feeders, everything like that. And uh, it's really easy to find stuff. Basically, you want to make sure that you're publishing something that's beautiful, something that has code, schematics, bills of materials, and uh, full instructions for how to create it. If you include things like CAD files and schematics, that's even better. Because people are happy when they can make something that looks finished. Um, this is something that Chip has done, the $9 computer. They have the Pocket Chip, which is um, basically a pocket computer that has a touch screen and a little clicky keyboard and stuff. And it looks kind of unfinished. It's not a great UI. Uh, but they've published everything that you need to get started hacking it. Uh, and they put up a few example projects from the company itself that give you examples that you can adapt and stuff. And since a huge part of our community is people who are software developers looking to get started in hardware, this is how people are used to learning. Um, 
teaching yourself is often about coming up with a project, looking for people who have done something similar, and then adapting that to your own use. Uh, and so the more references designs you have, uh, the easier it's going to be for people. Another great resource is running hackathons. Uh, I don't know if any of you have participated in the hackathon here, but um, if you have, I hope you have good luck. Uh, anyway, so it's great for companies because you get to get your software or hardware into the hands of people right away, and you get to see the first five minutes of their interactions with that, which means that either you get to see their first aha moment and help them get there, or you get this feedback that, oh my god, I'm so mad at this thing, and you go over and you see someone going like this, and you can figure out why they're going like this. You don't have to just like have that be the end for them. They're going to be able to ask your people questions and get um, in-person support, which turns that person who hates you into a person who probably feels OK or great about you. Um, besides that, you get to learn about your design and documentation, learn the pain points, and understand how you can improve your product and improve the documentation that goes around it. Build the like FAQ, the frequently asked questions about your product. And of course, you're going to get further use cases. You'll be able to show off the products in the end, but you'll also be able to learn what people actually want to use it for. You may be telling people that a board is great for wearables, but it's actually big and clunky, and they're like, oh man, what do I do? This, this, this is awful. But then someone comes in who wants to build a smart car, and they're like, oh man, this is awesome. I can tell how fast I'm going. I can get GPS. It's totally Wi-Fi uh, independent, so I don't have to worry about that. And you're like, oh, yeah, totally. It's a smart car device. Uh, one case in point of this was NXP. They were running some hackathons with us. Um, and they had this board called the Freedom Board, which was designed as basically a way for developers who were thinking about using the chip to explore its capabilities. And it was about yay big and had an accelerometer on it, which meant that it wasn't really great for wearable applications, but it wasn't super great for much else either. It was just sort of to demonstrate the capabilities of the chip. But they were like, hey, we have this board. Let's give it to makers. But through hackathons, they discovered that some other projects that already used their chip were superior. And so things like the Teensy, which uses the NXP chip, is really popular among people who make music projects because it's optimized for that. And they have an online GUI that helps you make code for it. And so instead of pushing this dev board that they had, they learned that they could reach out to the maker community and uh, promote their chip by instead pushing the Teensy. And then the light blue bean is the one that I mentioned, which is like a 30 buck dev board that's about this big. And it has a built-in proto board uh, and a bunch of broken out digital pins and analog pins, an accelerometer, and an RGB LED. And it's really compact. And that's all you really need to make a huge variety of products. So they didn't even think about doing hackathons. But we brought a few, and they ended up being wildly popular. So this is where I talk about a couple of things that Hackster does that also are great for makers or companies. So challenges. You can run challenges independently uh, as your own company, but you can also uh, participate in them as a maker. And you can also work with Hackster to do that. And basically, makers win because they get free hardware. They get an impetus to actually finish that project that's been sitting around forever. Companies get a bunch of usable, shareable design uh, reference designs. And uh, yeah, makers get money, too, and prizes, which is awesome. And then there's the free store, which is just another way to distribute uh, hardware to people who have earned points by posting projects. So you know that you're getting your uh, hardware into the hands of people who will actually use it and share what they do. And the last thing that I'm going to mention is artist residencies. So for example, Planet Labs is a company that sends satellites into space uh, not only are satellites very, very delicate, so you don't want to be sending like hacked, untested stuff up into space, but also they have an extremely limited uh, capacity for weight. And so it's not really easy to send things up, except for if you're the ping pong project, which sends like tiny science experiments and ping pong balls up into space, which is awesome. Uh, but what they can do 
is laser etch stuff on the side of the satellites. So they have this artist residency program where you can actually submit designs that go up into space on the side of a satellite and uh, you get to feel awesome about yourself and they get publicity from doing this awesome thing with artists and creating interesting new super hyper modern art with the biggest gallery of art in space. Uh, so even if you can't make your stuff open source, you can help other people put their own stamp on it and it makes them happy to share it. Like I'm doing right now, because this is on a satellite right now that is orbiting us and I designed it. But yeah, uh, so help people make weird things. You can do it by opening your hardware, opening your software, being sort of open-ish or like doing artist residencies or running events after the fact. All of this stuff is ways that you can engage with the maker community or if you're a maker, you can take advantage of this. Go forth and make weird stuff. Thank you. Are there any questions? Does anybody have a question? If not, that's okay. What's up? Hey. Uh, thank you for the talk. And how, how to get a big community for our product? How to get a big community for our product? So if you want to get a big community for your product, uh, you want to probably start at the point where you're funding. If you're doing crowdfunding, you can send people to uh, your own page when they have questions, and then you won't lose the people that you get that way, because half of it is getting people, and then the other half is not losing them once you have their attention. Um, and then the more that you do to get out there and talk to makers, like go to maker spaces, bring your thing along and show them, ask for feedback. Show that you're actually interested in other people and the product projects that they're doing, as well as promoting your own stuff. Um, the more you show this give and take with developers and makers, the more successful you're probably going to be. But also just going out there and meeting people. Because hardware is about not just staring at stuff on a screen. It's about being able to touch stuff and like grab onto it and solder things to it and whatever. Like, this is why we're into hardware. We like playing around with physical things. And so the more that you can get out there and talk to people in person and let them play around with the thing, the more popular I think it'll be. But also, it's about like, not just, you can also like do things like give away hundreds of them. But if there isn't a strong support structure to handle that, then it's going to be tough. So doc documentary, <laughs> documentation and the like forums have to be on point as well. Hi. Uh, so we recently won a Hexiware. We know it's made by, by NXP. We submitted a, a, a project made by us, by us uh, to develop some something made by Hexi with Hexiware. Oh, cool! Yes. Uh, you mentioned that saying that the our, the device can do anything is probably not a good slogan. Uh, what do you think about Hexiware using do, the, do any, the do anything device? Okay, uh, I will say that their as their name implies, they're very much pushing this as a wearable tech development device. Uh, so they're already narrowing the focus very much by doing that. Uh, so the fact that they've built in a heart rate sensor on that, for example, shows that you're supposed to sort of either wear it as like a pocket watch or on your wrist. And they're sort of, they've given a number of reference designs to show that. Oh, and actually, this is another way that you can uh, do that, is the Hexiware is basically a hexagon-shaped board uh, with some sensors and, and feedback uh, and interface options. But they also give you things like an attachment to turn it into a watch or a pocket watch or another type of device. So it's a way of like steering you at the same time that they don't tell you what to do with it. They sort of suggest. Here. Um, I, I have a question. As a maker and as a... I'm sorry, a little louder, uh, please? Sorry. Uh, I have a question regarding patents and publishing. Like, I know some open source hardware designs like the Exe, the Hackberry, the prosthesis that is open source on GitHub. And some people have published 
some papers saying that they designed it where they just stole it. Uh, I wanted to ask you, as a member of the, of the community, have you experienced something like that, that you design something, publish it, but someone else profits from it? And what can one do to fight against it? So um, I haven't had that happen to me personally. I generally don't work with pattern, patents, partly because I'm sort of lazy and it's a lot of time to document stuff. Um, and it takes a lot of research to make sure that what you're doing hasn't been done before. Uh, that's definitely a risk. One thing that you can do is publish it as a Creative Commons license. And they ha this is an open source license that has a lot of different options. So there's, uh, it's sort of like adding flags to a command in, in the terminal. Basically, you say it's Creative Commons. And then you can add, um, it has to be attributed to you, or non-commercial uses only, or share alike, which means that you have to share the plans just like you use something where the, share, the plans have been shared. And so that could give you some legal resource or recourse depending on the license that you choose to publish it under. Um, for example, on Hexter, we allow you to choose what license it is, including like GNU and whatever. Um, but beyond that, there's honestly not that much you can do. Even things that are under patent in the US, for example, people copy them and sell them in other countries. Uh, and a lot of people are really concerned about that, but then other people are like, well, I want quality and I want support, so I'm going to go with the official thing. So it's sort of something that you're always going to face, even if you do choose to uh, patent it yourself. Um, so I guess it's just it's your call. ¿Cómo se llamaba los sensores que utilizó para mover las orejas o las alas? Ah, eso fue el NeuroSky MindWave, uh, lo cual es un, un dispositivo que tiene un sensor en uh, la frente y también uno en la oreja uh, y combina uh, esos uh, <laughs> signos uh, para determinar qué está haciendo la mente, uh, el cerebro que produce uh, señales eléctricos uh, que indican si eres relajado o muy uh, focused. <laughs> uh, así que puede generar un mapa de cómo, se está, cómo estás sintiendo y no qué estás pensando, pero cómo lo estás pensando. Um, por ejemplo, si alguien llama mi nombre yo inmediatamente me siento más uh, enfocada, pero a la misma vez uh, ma, uh, menos relajada. Así que los dos señales hacen como así. Uh. <laughs> uh, y se llama NeuroSky. ¿NeuroSky? ¿NeuroSky? NeuroSky. Gracias. Um, uh, y lo que yo uso también es el MindFlex, lo cual es un uh, equipo para juegos uh, y es más barato. Gracias. Alex, uh, great talk. Um, what do you believe about uh, open source? I mean, I mean the impact in our society and uh, some tips with the uh, maker spaces because here in Mexico we got we are lack of maker spaces so uh, I, I would like your opinion about hacker spaces and uh, the impact of open source in our general society well uh, there's two main points that I would talk about in relation to that one is education and one is control So people who support open source often do it because they think that if you own a device, you don't truly own it unless you can open it and change it and put it back together and still have it be working and have that not be a crime. Uh, so it's sort of about being able to, to use those things that you own in the way that, you're, that you want to use them. Uh, so it's sort of this 
uh, thing about freedom or liberty or control of your own body. And that's becoming really important as we approach, um, as things like prosthetics become more open source. There's a few different projects uh, producing open source hands, for example, or legs. Uh, and it's making it much cheaper and more accessible for people to be able to create those things for themselves. And that's huge. So it's not just nerds and like people who want to to learn stuff. It's also people who have uh, disabilities uh, or all kinds of things that they want to solve. Uh, the fact that maker spaces are growing around the world too means that there's people who are putting themselves out there saying, I want to help you make your life better and teach you to make your own life better. So um, it's also responding to the way that a lot of nerds felt when they were being educated. So um, I would say that open source software is probably a bit more uh, widespread right now than hardware. I think partly because it's easier to work with. You don't have to order anything and have it come to you. You can just use your computer and you're already doing open source software. And a lot of these people were frustrated with growing up in an educational system that didn't understand technology yet because it was so young. Uh, and so people are starting to apply this to hardware. Um, people whose learning styles weren't well served by an educational system where you sit down with a textbook and you memorize some stuff. Uh, these people are like, well, I can teach myself. Uh, and so the people spreading knowledge among themselves with the open source community are sort of changing the landscape and the educational systems are starting to respond to that. So there's maker spaces being started in libraries and schools and things like that. So it's becoming a part of mainstream society as well. And that's really exciting. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much. Y'all have an awesome day. One more. <laughs> oh. <laughs>